Hey, it's Kevin. Well, we said we're going to be covering one exam a month, and it's September 2010, and this month's exam is Sea Voice. Sea Voice is a course that's really near and dear to my heart because I've been teaching it for such a long time. I've been teaching it since version 2. Point something back around 2001, and uh, Cisco Press. They got me to write a couple of different versions, the, uh, the second edition of the Seaboard Study Guide, and um, more recently the third edition of the Seaboard Study Guide. So it's something I'm really passionate about. And in today's video, and in the other videos we're going to be doing uh, during the month, we're going to be covering uh, some exam topics that might not necessarily be in the official curriculum. Cisco says that they can exercise the right to ask questions not in the curriculum, they might do that in C voice, and we'll try to touch on some of those tangential topics as we go through. But to really get going with C voice, I think we need to go back in time just a bit. Let's go back to the time that these kinds of phones were the phones people used in their homes. Now, this is a phone that I think it was back in the 50s or 60s. My dad converted into a lamp. Uh, you see, he worked at the uh, local telephone company for many, many years, and they were throwing away these older brass phones so that people could have phones with dials on them. They didn't have to talk to the operator first. But let's go back in those days and think about how a traditional phone like this worked. There's no dial on it. You cannot punch in 555-2020, for example, and call anyone. The way it worked was you would go off hook, and the light didn't come on, but you would go off hook, and when you would go off hook, it closed a circuit inside of the phone, and this circuit allowed loop current to flow from the local central office, and it would light up a light on the switchboard, and you would talk to an operator. Have you ever watched Andy Griffith, and Andy picks up the phone to call Floyd at the barbershop, and he talks to Sarah, and he says, Sarah, can you get me Floyd, and Floyd answers, <laughs> Andy, and they go on to have this conversation. Well, this is the kind of phone that they were using back in those old 1960s uh, TV shows, and the two wires that would feed into this phone and still feed into the phones of our home phones today, these two wires are called tip and ring. And the reason I brought in this phone, besides I just want to show you a really cool old phone, I wanted to show you where tip and ring originated from. Let's think about a stereo plug. Uh, this, is a, this is one of the newer stereo plugs. It's not as large as some of the old headphone stereo plugs you might have had when you were growing up. The old ones looked almost identical to the plugs used by switchboard operators, but the connectors are the same, so I want to show this to you. Notice at the tip of this plug we have one conductor, there's an insulator, there's another conductor, there's another insulator, and there's another conductor. The conductor connecting to the tip of the circuit is called the tip lead, and between these two insulators, where we have what appears to be a ring, the ring lead connects there, and then the other conductor is grounded. But typically we only think about these two leads, the tip and the ring. When we refer to tip and ring in telephony, the genesis of that really came from the tip and ring conductors on the tip and ring plug that the operator used to use. When we didn't dial numbers, we would just pick up the handset, we would get an operator, and typically this lady named Sarah would connect us with whoever we were wanting to talk with. The reason we're talking about tip and ring is because today's video is on analog voice ports. We'll get to digital later, but this is on analog voice ports. I want you to understand that there are three types of analog voice ports. FXS, FXO, and e and &M. FXS stands for Foreign Exchange Station. Here's the easy way to remember that. A station, like an analog phone, plugs into an FXS port. An FXO port stands for Foreign Exchange Office. Here's the easy way to remember that. Think of an office as being like a central office, a CO, the telephone company. You would connect an FXO port to something like the telephone company, back to the central office. Have you got one of those wall jacks in your home where you connect a regular analog phone? That kind of jack could be connected to an FXO port. And finally, kind of the oddball in the group is e and &M. e and &M stands for ear and mouth, earth and magneto, the E and receive the M and transmit. Different literature says different things. I typically think of ear and mouth. E and M 
is not going to connect to a phone. It's not going to connect directly back to the central office as we normally think of it. E&M is often used by PBXs, private branch exchanges, which are privately owned telephone systems. You would have different companies and they would have their own phone switch and if they wanted to interconnect a couple of locations, they might use an E&M circuit to do that. Let me show you first of all an FXS port on a router. Here we have a 2611XM router and you'll see that there is a module installed in the slot, the network module slot in this router. This module is an NM1V, Network Module 1 Voice. The 1V meeting we can insert one voice card. And that's what we've done. We have one voice interface card, one VIC, inserted in this network module. This voice interface card has two FXS ports. Notice we can plug a couple of regular telephone sets into these FXS ports. And this FXS port, acting like a central office, is going to provide dial tone to those connected phones. It's going to be able to interpret dial digits coming from those phones. And it's going to apply negative 48 volts of DC across the tip and ring leads going out to those phones. Just to review, we have three types of analog voice ports, FXS, FXO, e &M. Now let's think about signaling. For example, in your home, if you were to lift the handset off hook on one of your home phones, how does the central office know to send dial tone to that phone? Well, what's happening is a circuit is closing inside of the phone, like we talked about on the lamp on that brass old phone. A circuit is closing, allowing current to start flowing through the circuit that's called the local loop. The local loop, that's the connection between the central office and your home, for example. And when current flows through that local loop, it's called loop current, and that's the indication to the telephone central office that it needs to provide dial tone. Let's consider this on a whiteboard for a moment. The central office is applying negative 48 volts of DC across the tip and ring leads, these red and green wires, and there is a circuit inside of your phone that's physically open when it's on hook. When you go off hook, this circuit closes, allowing loop current to flow. Which brings up the question, if the circuit's open, how can we send ringing voltage through an open circuit? Your phone rings when it's on hook, doesn't it? How does that work? Well, actually, I didn't completely draw out the schematic. Inside of the phone there is also a capacitor. And a capacitor is an electrical component that will allow alternating current to pass, but it blocks direct current. So it's blocking the loop current coming from the central office, but if the central office were to send ringing voltage, ringing voltage is alternating current that would go through the capacitor and it would allow the phone to ring. What we've just described here is a type of signaling called a loop start. We know the phone went off hook because there is current flowing through the local loop. But there's an issue with loop start. With loop start, we're subject to a phenomenon called glare. Has this ever happened to you? You go to pick up your phone in your home and you pick it up and there's no dial tone and you say, hello, hello, is someone there? and someone's on the other end. You didn't dial anyone. You didn't hear dial tone. You just picked up the phone and someone's there. What happened? They were calling into you, but you beat the signaling. Before your phone ever rang, you picked up the handset and you were able to talk to this person on the far end. That's called glare. Not a big deal in our homes, probably. This might happen once, twice a year. However, think about a large corporate PBX where we might have thousands of phones sharing only hundreds of lines coming in. In that case, the probability that glare is going to occur increases exponentially. Glare would not be a good thing in a PBX environment. As a result, we don't do this. We do not do loop start signaling for large PBXs. Pay phones, that's another time we don't do loop start signaling. What do we do? Ground start signaling. To illustrate ground start signaling, consider a payphone. Payphones often use ground start signaling, and with ground start signaling, it's not current flowing through the tip and ring leads that indicates to the central office that we've gone off hook or paid our money in a payphone. Now, with ground start signaling, when there is a ground potential applied to the ring lead, that's the indication that we've gone off hook. Let me illustrate this by going back to one of my favorite movies from 1983. 1983 had a great movie called War Games. Do you remember with Matthew Broderick and Ali Sheedy? 
In War Games, Matthew Broderick, he came out of the NORAD headquarters at one point, and he goes up to a payphone, and he wants to make a phone call, but I guess he doesn't have any money, so what he does, he takes the handset off hook, and bang, 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 he bangs the handset against the chassis, he loosens up the transmitter cap, takes up the little carbon transmitter, takes one of the wires from the handset, and touches it to the chassis. He touches the ring lead to the ground potential on the chassis, and as a result, he's able to make a phone call. How is that possible? That's the way ground start signaling works. He applied a ground potential to the ring lead. Now, don't try this at home. This will not work today. Today, there is circuitry inside of payphones to prevent this from happening. When I used to work at the GTE labs, and I would evaluate payphones, so that was a test I had to run. This is back in the late 80s when I was doing this, and we made sure that phones would not do that. But Back in the good old days, that's how you could trick a phone into making a free call for you. Let's go back to our whiteboard for a moment. We've talked about loop start and ground start signaling thus far, but it's important to realize those are the signaling options we have for FXS and FXO ports. What about those E&M ports we spoke of? Well, E&M is a bit different. E&M is wired up like this. We're going to still have a tip and ring lead. We'll see that that is our tip red will be our ring and the tip and ring wires are still going to be carrying the voice just like they do with FXS and FXO ports however in addition to the tip and ring leads we also have an E lead and an M lead the E and the M leads are used to carry the signaling again voice goes over tip and ring signaling goes over E and M there's a couple ways that we can wire up the tip and ring though, you can have an entire tip circuit. You could have two tip wires and you can have two ring wires. An entire circuit for tip, an entire circuit for ring. This is called four wire operation. However, if we only have a single ring lead and a single tip lead, that's called two wire operation. And E&M does not use loop start or ground start signaling. Let me show you what it does use. E&M is going to use one of these three types of signaling. Wink start, immediate start, or delay start. Probably in the real world, when you're working with this, you're going to be working with wink start. Here's how wink start works. With wink start, the equipment attached to the PBX needs to get some confirmation from the PBX that it's okay to send the digits. Let's go back in time just a bit. Back in the old days, PBXs used to have internal mechanical registers and these registers had to be mechanically reset so that they would be ready to receive digits from the attached equipment and wink start is a way of asking the PBX are you ready to receive digits and without getting into all the schematics and what voltage gets applied to what lead just think with wink start we ask the PBX, the router specifically asks the PBX if it's ready to receive digits by applying voltage to one of the leads and the PBX responds by winking. Literally it's going to apply a voltage to a lead and take the voltage away. It's an electrical wink. The visual that I get, I think of Tina Fey on Saturday Night Live when she's imitating Sarah Palin. She does one of those Sarah Palin winks. Well that's what I think about when I think of wink start. The PBX is winking back to us and saying, yep, it's okay, go ahead and send us the digits. With immediate start, you might think that we would just start sending immediately, but that's almost a little bit misleading. With immediate start, we're going to wait a certain period of time, and then we're going to blindly send the digits whether the PBX is ready or not. And with delay start, it's kind of a mixture of the two. With delay start, we're going to wait a period of time like we did with immediate start and we still need to see a voltage transition like we did with wink start that's delay start the bottom line is you're not going to be making this decision when you connect a router to a PBX you just need to make it work with whatever the PBX is already configured to do but as a real world tip it's probably going to be wink start those are the different signaling types for ENM but we need to understand that there's something else we need to set with E&M, and that's the E&M type. Not the signaling type, but the E&M type. 